Imagine you can spend an entire week digging in the ground, scanning for ruins, and taking photographs of the world's most surreal archaeological sites. Would you be up for it? Grab your magnifying glasses and let's do some digging. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Walk around the city stumbling upon ancient history, I mean. So you're strolling around Esquiline Hill on a sunny afternoon. You have just finished your third gelato when you suddenly see it. The magnificent Dalmus Aurea, or Golden House, for the non-Latin speakers. The Roman Emperor Nero ordered to build this huge palace back in 64 BCE. The construction finished in 68 BCE. In its glory days, it occupied an area three times the size of the Vatican City. The building had gold leaf decor, semi-precious stones, and tons, tons of frescoes. There were over 300 rooms in the palace, some of them overlooking the beautiful vineyard and animal-filled woods nearby. It held an enormous 100-foot statue of Nero himself. The octagonal wall was the grandest construction in the complex. Originally, it was a banquet hall with waterfalls cascading down the back walls. The hall rotated around its axis day and night as petals fell from above. Nero's successors stripped the whole palace of its materials. Today, tourists can visit the main structure and, of course, the octagonal hall. They excavated it and you'll easily recognize it even with its bare walls. After flying halfway across the world, we're deep in the Cambodian jungle. Good thing you brought bug spray with you. Mosquitoes can get crazy in this tropical climate. Hidden among the forest is the city of Angkor. It was the capital of the Khmer Empire from the 9th to 15th century. FYI, the word Angkor means capital city in the Khmer language. The city became one of the largest in the pre-industrial world. Researchers say nearly 1 million people used to live there. Today, Angkor attracts visitors from around the world because of its stunning architecture. You can recognize the Khmer style in the use of huge blocks of sandstone. At the center of the complex lies Bayon Temple. It's decorated with 216 smiling faces, which scientists say are meant to resemble the founder of the Angkor Empire. They believe the towers used to be decorated with gold, but today the site is a maze of vine-covered temples. The city was abandoned in 1431 and wasn't rediscovered until the 1840s. In 1992, they named it a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The United States is not usually synonymous with ruins, but here's one. In the mountainous state of Colorado lies the ancient home place of ancestral Pueblons. Throughout the Mesa Verde National Park, there are over 600 cliff dwellings built by the Pueblons around the 1190s. The Cliff Palace alone had over 150 rooms. It was a multi-story building of sandstone and mud mortar. To arrive at the Balcony House, visitors had to climb a 32-foot ladder. There, you can see a mid-sized village of 38 rooms and two kivas. Kivas are traditional chambers built by Pueblons for ceremonial purposes. By 1300, the Pueblon occupation of the Mesa Verde ended. Thankfully, the site is open for visits now. If you like terracotta landscapes, you came to the right place. The city of Petra is a marvel of the ancient world. Located in Jordan's desert, the city was a commercial hub back in the 4th century BCE. The Nabataeans, an Arab Bedouin tribe, lived in the so-called Rose City and thrived for many years, accumulating a significant amount of wealth. They invented an innovative water management system that made the region habitable. The rock-carved gate-light structure Petra is famous for is what is called the Pharaoh's Treasury. It stands at the main entrance to the site and is said to have a hidden treasure beneath it. In the early 2000s, the site was named one of the seven new wonders of the world. All the way in South America, in the country of Guatemala, lie ancient Mayan ruins. The lost city of Tikal is a site made of 12,000 buildings, the remains of the capital of the ancient Mayan Empire. It is comparable in importance to London or New York. The North Acropolis is Tikal's most ancient complex of monuments. Built solely by human hands in 750 BCE, 
It served as the resting place of kings and chiefs. Back in the day, the Step Pyramid temples were painted a beautiful red. Mayans loved that color. Today, of course, you'll only see the limestone. Archaeologists have no clue as to the cause of Tikal's decline. Was it drought, disease, or something else altogether? Located on the left bank of the River Tigris is a strange old ruin, a battered archway. It belonged to a city named Tesiphon, the jewel of the Persian Empire for over 800 years. The city hosted an extravagant palace, decorated with a glass mosaic, jewel-adorned carpets, and a lot of marble. What is it with royalty and marble anyway? The arch was part of an imperial palace complex. Until modern times, it was the largest man-made freestanding vault. Notice how there are no pillars sustaining it. The enormous wealth of the city made it a constant target for other empires, until it eventually fell. In the mood for some more Mayan ruins? Chichen Itza is an archaeological site with the best preserved pyramids on Earth. Located in Mexico's Yucatan state, this Mayan city is well over 1,500 years old. At its peak, it was home to 35,000 people. The site has a total of 26 ruins to be uncovered. The highlight here is El Castillo, a tremendous step-like temple standing 80 feet above the ground. Its most peculiar feature is that it has 91 steps up each of its four sides, including the upper platform. It makes for 365 steps, the number of days in the solar year. The oldest lost city in this list dates back to the Neolithic period. It was when us, human beings, started farming for the first time, instead of living a fully nomadic lifestyle based on hunting and gathering. Located on Orkney Island off the coast of Scotland is a prehistoric site known as Scara Bray. Thanks to good restoration, the site is very well preserved. You can see prehistoric dwellings with hearths, stone-built furniture, and even primitive toilets. Researchers found runic symbols on the site, which means they could have attempted some form of writing. Ah, Greece. Fancy some feta cheese, anyone? We've arrived at the focal point of archaeological sites, but today we're exploring one in particular, the Colossus of Rhodes, also known as the Bronze Giant. It used to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, standing in the harbor of the Greek city of Rhodes back in the 3rd century BCE. The Colossus was said to be 105 feet tall. It's believed that the statue was built with the help of 900 camels. Sadly, it only stood for 54 years. A ravaging earthquake tore it to pieces, so visitors would come and see only a giant foot. Now, there is a whole load of nothing where the statue once stood. I think it's safe to say there are a lot of random ruins on walls spread across the globe. And our final visit for the day consists of exactly those. All the way in northern England lies the ruin of Hadrian's Wall. The Roman Emperor commissioned the wall in order to separate his empire from Britain's. The original wall was a lot grander than what is left of it today. But still, the ruins are pretty impressive. They consist of a 73-mile structure stretching from one coast to the other. Back in the day, Hadrian's Wall hosted 17 large forts and numerous observation towers to ensure the maximum safety of his empire. The wall fell into oblivion when the Romans left Britain at the start of the 5th century. People began looting it to build churches, farms, and even houses. Today, if you decide to visit the ruins, you'll only see waist-high fragments of stone. But still, pretty neat, huh? It's one of the most important national monuments of the United States, with over a half a million visitors each year. The Washington Monument was constructed to commemorate George Washington, the first American president. But if you've ever looked at it closely, in person, or by googling its pictures, you've surely noticed it has two different colors. Well, it's not a design choice, if that's what you're wondering. The Washington National Monument Society, the authority in charge of the construction, ran out of funding and the project was put on hold in the 1850s. It took another 25 years for the authorities to resume the construction. They finished the upper two-thirds of the monument in 1884. 
Since they evidently used marble from a different location, given the time that had passed, it was difficult to envision how these materials would behave in the future. These two sections look very much alike at first, but with time, mostly due to winds, rain, and erosion, they ended up having different hues. There's even a third portion of marble, which is noticeable only if you pay very close attention. The constructors initially went for a marble provider in Massachusetts, but quickly realized the colors didn't match. They had to switch to another supplier, but their mistake resulted in this third shade of marble. It's only noticeable up front, so people mostly think that the monument has two colors. The builders figured out the difference quite fast and found a type of marble that resembled the initial one. But the new material eventually turned to a different color too, mostly to weather conditions. Are you one of those people who like to spend their free time on Pinterest or Instagram in search of your next travel location? Then you surely haven't missed a little Italian town called Cinque Terre. The reason why it's so popular among photographers and globetrotters is its brightly painted buildings, which come in a nice contrast to the crystal clear ocean waters. These houses come in a huge selection of colors, from green to yellow and even bright pink. So it's no wonder this location is such a hit. It looks more like a painting than an actual place on Earth. But why are these houses so gorgeously bright? Local legends say that fishers used to paint their homes in various colors so that they could quickly spot them from the water as they came back home from the sea. Now, some other buildings come with coloring so specific that their inhabitants are prohibited from changing it by law. It's the case of the Pink City, otherwise known as Jaipur in India. It has numerous buildings of different hues of pink, from dusty rose to fuchsias. This impressive coloring dates back to the 1800s. Rumor has it that the Indian Maharaja of the time, Sawai Ram Singh, wanted to welcome Prince Albert during his visit. So he literally painted the whole town pink. Which, of course, begs the question, why he chose pink and not any other color? And it turns out this hue was meant to subtly imply the idea of a welcoming location or a place of hospitality. Jaipur isn't the only monochrome city in the world. Its blue counterpart is located in Morocco. It's called Chefchaouen. Some locals say that the city is painted blue to symbolize the beautiful coloring of the Mediterranean Sea. Others consider that painting their houses blue keeps them cooler when it's hot. There are even claims that painting a house blue can help keep mosquitoes away. People believe that the hue resembles the waves of the sea, which isn't a really desirable location for insects, if you think about it. Now, this construction has become the undeniable symbol of the city of love. Ah, the Tourifel. I can smell a freshly baked baguette, can't you? Well, it turns out the Eiffel Tower has a little chromatic secret of its own. This famous French monument is painted chestnut brown these days, but it hasn't always been this color. The engineer who built the tower and also gave it its name was a man called Gustave Eiffel. He claimed that the initial paint used for the tower, a very bright red, was supposed to help protect the construction from rust kind of like the Golden Gate Bridge does in San Francisco. But since it was built, the Eiffel Tower has had many different hues, like ochre, yellow, and several shades of brown. At one point, they even used the ombre paint effect. It made the tower look as if it was fading upon reaching the sky. I've hardly ever heard a more touching story than that of the Taiwanese rainbow grandpa. His name is Huang Yong Fu, and his story begins in the late 2000s. Given he was officially the last resident, the local authorities were just about to bring down his small village in order to make room for a modern apartment complex. To cope with his sadness, the man started painting the walls of the houses in his village. He began with drawings of birds, cats, and eventually people. In 2010, a local university student found out about this little DIY project, and the rest was history. With the help of a fundraising campaign, this little village now attracts a staggering number of tourists each year, over a million. It's no wonder the local authorities eventually renounced their plans. While we're on the subject of beautiful designs, 
there's a library out there that actually looks like a giant bookshelf. No, it's not a scene from a fantasy movie. Somebody actually built that. One of the facades of the Kansas City Public Library looks like an ordinary row of books lined up on a shelf. Well, not really ordinary, since the books are 25 feet tall and 9 feet wide each. You don't need to be a book nerd to want to check this one out soon. The world's largest basket isn't meant for overweight cats. It's actually a building. Yep, there's a building out there that is actually shaped like a basket. You can find it in Newark, Ohio. It was initially built to serve as headquarters for the Longoburger Company, an American producer of handcrafted wood baskets. It's also renowned among professionals as one of the best-known examples of mimetic architecture. That's a type of design where buildings are constructed to mimic their function or purpose. The building covers 180,000 square feet. It cost around $30 million to build and was completed in 1997. With seven floors and a central atrium, it also has a glass ceiling which lets natural light get inside. This immense basket is also topped with two steel handles. They're equipped with heating elements that prevent them from freezing. They also protect the glass atrium situated right below from any ice that might fall on it during the winter season. Darmstadt, Germany, there's a residential building complex built in the 1990s, named the Weichspirale. It has a wonderful design, as well as an interesting story to back it up. The name literally translates to forest spiral. This might refer to the plan of the building, along with the fact that its roof is green. Not simply in color, though. This swirly building has a jaw-dropping forest on its roof, with maple and lime trees. The unique construction was completed in 2000. It has 105 apartments and more than 100 windows, each of them with its particular shape and size. With 12 floors at its highest point, the building also houses a cafe and a bar. Another interesting feature? Each corner in the construction is rounded off. Now, should you ever find yourself visiting the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, try not to miss the cube houses. These unique buildings are placed above ground level on top of a pedestrian bridge close to the city center and the Rotterdam Black metro station. In the 20th century, the city of Rotterdam was damaged. That's why later, it became the focus of new, cutting-edge architecture designs. Dutch architect Piet Blom started designing functional housing, which could also leave some room for pedestrians on the ground level. He got the idea for these houses from simple elements, such as forests and trees. Each house is placed on a hexagonal pylon, a construction made of concrete and designed to look like the trunk of a tree. Each of these pylons has a staircase that leads to well-spaced living areas. Another example of a house that looks like it has just escaped from a fairy tale is the Nautilus House. You can find it near Mexico City, Mexico. With its shell-like shape, it's also one of the first representations of bio-architecture. The man behind this unique design is Javier Senosien. He was inspired by the works of Gaudi and Frank Lloyd Wright. The very concept of bioarchitecture is that buildings should be constructed based on structures found in nature. It's also supposed to remind people of their local history and traditions. The Nautilus House doesn't have a lot of storage space, according to the builders. But this structure is supposed to be earthquake-resistant and maintenance-free. Not to mention hundreds of tiny rainbow-colored stained-glass windows decorating the building. Let's play a little guessing game. I'm going to name the sites you have on your bucket list. Machu Picchu, the Colosseum, Petra, Taj Mahal. Did I get at least one of them right? I have to confess, I was just taking them off the list of the new seven wonders of the world. It was officially finished in 2007 after a worldwide vote. What happened to the old list? Well, it was put together in the second century BCE. And there is just one site currently still standing, the Pyramids of Giza. Pack your bags. We're going to Peru, the home of the mighty Machu Picchu. When it was first discovered in 1911, its explorer thought he had managed to find the lost city of the Inca. Several decades later, it turned out it wasn't the same city. Plus, there were still three farmer families living there, so it couldn't be really called lost and forgotten. No wonder they like it so much there. The stones making up the buildings are cut so precisely and sit together so tightly that you can't even insert a credit card between them. 
It has saved the city from some serious earthquakes, which are common here. The buildings just dance through all the shaking and then go back into place. And because of the way it's arranged, you can see the sun rise or set exactly behind the important peaks on important days for the Inca. More than half, 60% of all the construction in Machu Picchu was done underground, so you can't even see it. The best part is that there are still things to be discovered if you want to get your name inked in history. Our next stop is on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. The mighty Chichen Itza sits here for well over 1,500 years. The structure has exactly 365 steps. You can count when you go next time if you don't trust me. The Maya, who built the whole thing, were really into astronomy. So it's not surprising they made as many steps as there are days in a year. Also, if you happen to be here during the spring or fall equinox, you'll notice the shadows the setting sun casts make it look like there's a snake going down the stairs. The feathered serpent was one of the main deities in ancient Mexico. Chichen Itza used to be a busy urban center. It had its ups and downs. And by the time the Spanish arrived, the 16th century, it had been mostly abandoned. The first photos we have from the spot are from the end of the 19th century. Looks like the terraced pyramid had a lot more vegetation on it back in 1892. The only source of fresh water in this dry climate is the cenotes, or water-filled sinkholes. There are four visible cenotes, and the temple pyramid most likely stands on top of one more. Archaeologists are looking for tunnels to enter it. To see our next wonder, you must be prepared to share it with around 15,000 others. That's how many people visit the statue of Christ the Redeemer every day. The statue sits above the Corcovado mountain and weighs roughly 635 tons. Must have been tricky to lift it all the way up there. Actually, it came in parts. A French sculptor, Paul Landowski, made several pieces of the future sculpture out of clay. The head and the hands were made in full size and the body would be made larger on the spot. The parts of the statue were cut into cubes and then cast into concrete and put together. Workers prepared the cement right on the spot and transferred all the tools by a small cogwheel railroad which tourists used to get up the hill. The statue is the best proof that lightning does strike in the same place more than once. It must be because of its position on top of the mountain, its fingers, head, and eyebrows got damaged by storms. Time to move on. This time, we're going to Agra, India. Yep, to see the Taj Mahal, that beautiful pink construction. Wait, wasn't it always white? Well, the Taj Mahal changes its color depending on what time it is. It looks pale pink or pearly gray at sunrise, crystal white at noon, and the sunset paints it orange bronze. In the evening, it may even seem translucent blue. And that's not the only optical illusion here. When you move towards the main gate, the building seems gigantic. But the closer you get to it, the smaller it looks. The minarets, or towers, on both sides might seem to be standing perfectly straight, but in reality, they're leaning outward. It's done for aesthetic balance, and also to prevent the towers from falling on the main building in case of an earthquake. For construction finished in the 17th century, the Taj Mahal looks good as new. That's because it regularly gets a spa day. They apply a proper facial mud pack to it, which is a traditional recipe to keep the radiance. I'm feeling peckish from all the traveling. How about we go to Italy and have some pasta? Just kidding. The real reason would be to see the Colosseum, of course. Its original name was the Flavian Amphitheater because it was built by the Flavian dynasty. The new name is most likely after the colossal bronze statue of Emperor Nero that was once next to the building. The model for the statue was the Colossus of Rhodes. In its nearly 2,000 years, the Colosseum has lived through at least three major fires and four earthquakes. It was damaged, repaired, and rebuilt many times. The impressive construction once hosted up to 80,000 spectators. What they watched wasn't necessarily as cruel as Hollywood made us believe. Most gladiator matches went under strict rules. <sighs> Sometimes the public would get bored with the show and the participants would draw out of the arena. Once the Colosseum stopped serving as an arena for those scary shows, it was used as a cemetery, 
a place of worship, for housing, workshops for artisans and merchants, the home of a religious order and a fortified castle. Now it's open to the public and you can check out its underground labyrinth. Are you ready for the next wonder? It's the lost city of Petra, or rather, the rediscovered city, which was once super rich and vibrant, then got abandoned and found again in 1812. The whole city is made of sandstone, and even though it's in the desert, it has seen some pretty heavy rains. Still, it has lasted 2,000 years thanks to some very skilled workers. Modern laser scanning showed that they put giant steps into the mountain to check the quality of the rock and carve out the buildings without risking their lives. And how did people survive here in the desert without any water? The Nabataeans who lived here developed a whole complicated system of conduits, dams and cisterns to make sure they have enough vital fluid for the whole year. In case you're in your Indiana Jones mode, there's still a lot to discover here in Petra. Archaeologists believe we only know 15% of the city by now, and the rest is still hidden underground. Let's finish our tour with the largest human-made project in the world. Yep, I'm talking about the Great Wall of China. It stretches for over 13,000 miles from the Bohai Sea in the east all the way to the Gobi Desert in the west. But don't trust the popular myth. You won't really see the wall from the moon it took over 2,000 years to finish, and a good amount of building materials, mostly bricks and cut stone blocks. Have you ever scratched your name on a tree or even worse, some famous place? No worries, I won't tell anyone. People who built the wall did the same. Some of the bricks, which are mostly from the Ming Dynasty, have some data like production location, brick household name, and the responsible officials. This was a form of quality control. If something happened to any of the bricks, it would be easy to find out who to blame for it, 